So everyone should see a um, message pop up that this meeting is being recorded. And I'll hand it over to you, Michelle. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Nice to see you all. I am calling this meeting to order at 2.04 p.m. of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly, Monday, November 7th. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. And I'm going to go ahead and do a sound check. Um, I believe that both Hala and Yvonne will not be able to join us today. Alexis, I'm very happy to see you. I wanted to uh, speak with you about dates because I know you said Mondays are starting to be tough. So we'll do that too. Um, so let's start with you, Ms. Bridges. I'm right here. Okay, we can hear you. Dr. Rhodes. Oh, here and I can hear. I can hear and I can I assume I can be seen. Very well seen, Dr. Rhodes. <laughs> you are seen. <laughs> um, Pamela. Oh, I'm here. Okay, excellent. Uh, and Alexis. Good to be here. Thank you. Great. And Dr. Schwaz. Presente. All right. And Jennifer, I think just let's you're good you okay can hear me. I can hear you <laughs> yeah and uh Hala I'm I didn't read your text in full so I just told the group I didn't know if you were joining us I'm so happy you're here <laughs> yes a little bit choppy but um I did hear your voice come through can you hear us yes okay. great all right. So um, welcome, everyone. Before we move into our agenda items, I wanted hey, <laughs> um, I wanted to take just a couple minutes um, for those of us who were able to join the Mojuba event yesterday that was co-hosted by the Black Assembly of Amherst, Massachusetts and Bridge for Unity. I first want to just really give a very deep and heartfelt thank you to the folks who sponsored and organized that event. Um, it was extraordinarily powerful and um, very, very meaningful. So would love to hear um, from Dr. Shabazz and Hala and Dr. Rhodes um, about that just a little bit. I see before we do that, that Ms. Bridges' hands is up. Yes. Um, I was a little disturbed to something. So it, it disturbed my heart so much that I had to write it down. And I just wanted to read something. Um, and I have to leave because I have a very important eye appointment, but yeah. just let me get this out. I might stumble, but it's something that I need to say. Um, as you know, my purpose of joining this committee um, was to add a descendant voice to the history of my ancestors that have been left out of the committee's initial reports, but we deserve, I feel, to have a voice in how our stories are told and shared and I wanted to make sure future generations know about the everyday Blacks at the roots of Amherst history, where you know I wholeheartedly support events that share the Black history of Amherst. I was disheartened to read that the event yesterday that was promoted and supported by this committee claimed that it was, I quote, likely the first public event in Amherst to incorporate and honoring of black ancestors. Uh, this is not only not the truth, but it's offensive and it spreads information that the, to the community. I feel it causes harm to those who have done so before yesterday, who experienced oh. the harm we are charged to repair, um, including myself. Um, they date back decades and recently as June, 2021, the Juneteenth Heritage Walk in June 2022 in the, in the Ancestral Bridges exhibit. 
that closed this past Saturday. All included direct descendants honoring their black ancestors in their burial ground of West Cemetery. Statements that moved the discovery as such, um, it just acknowledges to yesterday, erase those that came before. And I was, I'm just very disturbed at it. And I just wanted you to know, sorry, I have to meet, leave the meeting, but please take what I said as coming from my heart. Because to read that, it was very disturbing. But I wish you all a good day. I got to go and I'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you, Ms. Bridges. Thank you. You're welcome. Sharing that from your heart. We really appreciate it. Um, my dog is deciding that he wants to bark at something outside. So um, if we could just take a minute to pause here, I'm going to let my dog go outside and we'll be right back in just a second. All right, um, so let's just check in here as a committee. I really want to honor Ms. Bridges' statement and voice. Um, and I don't feel personally comfortable pursuing any conversation about Ms. Bridges' statement while she is not in the room. Um, so what I would like to ask is that we hold that uh, close to our heart and that if Ms. Bridges would like to talk further about it in our next meeting, we allow there to be space for that to happen next meeting. In the meantime, if there's anything that any individual member feels like they would like to pursue individually with Ms. Bridges, um, with respect to her statement, I would encourage that. Um, so I do want to uh, just come back to the, so I started off by seeing if there was anybody who would like to speak in particular about the event that occurred yesterday. Um, it does feel a little bit unsettling to talk about it again without Ms. Bridges here, given the context of her statement. Um, however, if anybody would like to speak to the event, um, this would be the time to do that now, and we'll leave just a minute to do that. All right. Yeah. Yes, Alexis. I'll just say I, I regret not being able to be there in person, but I, I want to thank Dr. Shabazz for live streaming because that allowed me to um, join in. So but thank you for that. I appreciate it. All right. And I think I saw um, Dr. Shabazz, but before we go to you, Dr. Shabazz, I see Pamela's hand is raised. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. Was the, the event co-sponsored by this group or sponsored by another group and we just lend it support? I'm just trying to, I don't, I know we don't, I think you're, it's appropriate not to talk about it, but I would just like a little bit of information. Sure. Um, no, the event was in no way sponsored by the AHRA. Okay. Um, certain members of us sat on the panel um, and had a dialogue with Dr. Shabazz during the event, um, but the event was, um, Dr. Shabazz, why don't you jump in and say who the sponsors of the event were? Absolutely. So um, the genesis of the event uh, is with an intergroup uh, dialogue um, uh, organization called uh, Bridge for Unity uh, that has existed here 
uh, for a number of years and um, attempts to try to promote uh, intercultural and, and uh, interracial understanding uh, through uh, intergroup dialogue as well as small, uh, as well as uh, cultural exchanges. And um, the uh, um, idea was presented of a, uh, uh, a celebration and honoring of the ancestors, African uh, ancestors here in Amherst uh, that would be conducted in a traditional West African, particularly Yoruba uh, um, uh, ceremony. Uh, and folks who are uh, two of our Bridge for Unity members who are long practitioners uh, um, initiated in uh, this particular uh, uh, West African uh, cosmology, cosmology, spiritual system uh, offered to uh, create the ceremonial part of the event. And, uh, and that is what they did. And I think the uh, kind of unfortunate thing uh, in the press release and uh, that I think was published in the Indy and perhaps in other places. And in fact, the language of it, of the, of it was attributed to a statement from me, but uh, not in quote marks, but, that, uh, uh, but attributed to me was saying that it was the first event of this kind to honor black ancestors but it should have read or it should have been more clear within this West African cultural framework. Um, it was by no means, uh, uh, is this the first time that ancestors of Amherst, I was on the walk uh, sponsored by Ancestral Bridges this past Juneteenth. I've been in terms of other activities here, whether in West Cemetery or elsewhere in town, honoring uh, uh, ancestors, uh, African-American ancestors. So by no means would I uh, uh, wish to make a statement or would make a statement that it's the first time African ancestors when I've attended and been a part of events that have done so, uh, uh, mul multiple events that have done so. So I do very much uh, apologize and, and feel that was an unfortunate way that the language in which that came out. I think the sense of it was more, um, and we didn't even have to reference that as like a first, but I think the, the, the sense of uh, what was conveyed uh, meant to be conveyed in the press release and in what was reported was in the within this West African um, uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, tradition. It was one of the first times, but again, even that we didn't necessarily have to say that or emphasize it, but certainly not to say the first that anybody has bothered to end to honor the ancestors. That that would not. Um, again, I, I'm a living witness to, that knows that that's not the first time anything has been done of that sort. So very much apologize for the uh, 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 wording that came out in the, uh, from, the, from the, the press release on that matter. But overall, I am, uh, was very excited. I'm very Dr. excited. Buzz, could I just ask you one moment to pause? I'm going to come back to you. Just seeing that Ms. Bridges rejoined, um, I just wanted to let Ms. Bridges know if she can hear us. I think she maybe she's traveling. I don't see that her audio is connecting, um, but I'm just going to say this in the case that Ms. Bridges can hear us. Um, that we agreed, Ms. Bridges, um, that it. I did not feel comfortable pursuing a conversation about this without you here, um, and everybody was in agreement about that, and that if there were individual conversations that could happen, or if we could continue the conversation when you were back with us next meeting, that's what we would pursue. Um, Pamela asked just a very direct question for the notes, I think, to ask whether this committee sponsored the event or who it was sponsored by. Um, and the answer to that question is that the AHRA didn't sponsor the event. Um, members of the AHRA sat on the panel of the event, but it was co-sponsored by Bridge for Unity and the Black Assembly of Amherst, Massachusetts. And I think you came in, Ms. Bridges, when Dr. Shabazz was talking about the genesis of the event, how it came to be, who it was meant to recognize, and in which cultural framework. Um, so 
if you have any questions or of course the video will be available, you could hear through that as well. So I just wanted to make that. And did that clarify the question for you, Pamela? Okay, great. All right, so back to you, Dr. Shabazz. And um, Ms. Bridges, please, if you can speak and would like to speak, speak, just go ahead and raise your hand. But right now it looks like your audio is having trouble connecting. Um, okay, Dr. Shabazz, back to you. So just as far as that goes, um, I uh, was very appreciative of, uh, of, my F of the efforts of uh, Rose uh, Milligan Saki and uh, Dr. Trevor uh, Baptiste for the energy and the uh, 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 brilliance and the very, very um, deep, uh, careful, explanatory way for, for folks not very familiar with, uh, with West African religious traditions, spiritual traditions, very explanatory about every aspect of it, the libation uh, to the ancestors, the cleansing uh, with uh, uh, the, the water, uh, the, um, uh, the whole, uh, uh, the egun stick, and the uh, the ways in which that uh, uh, you know, and and in the Yoruba language, the words um, to recall and to remember all our ancestors, uh, all all our uh, from the Middle Passage who died on the Middle Passage to uh, to the Americas who were brought here uh, to Massachusetts uh, in chains, enslaved, and uh, in the years of the practice of slavery uh, in, in, in Massachusetts, in Amherst in particular, that uh, were very explanatory with everything. I appreciate both of them. They're both wonderful uh, educators and wonderfully uh, um, educational, uh, spiritual uh, uh, folks. So very much appreciated that that was one part of it. The event was three parts parts. One part was that part. The second part was the opportunity for uh, members of the AHRA that could attend to update about where our process is. And then the third part consisted of an inter of breaking out into small breakout groups to discuss uh, uh, ideas and, and uh, um, uh, feelings about the reparative justice process in Amherst, and then to report that that back into the big group, and followed finally by that by some delicious food, courtesy of uh, 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 the Black Sheep, the Blue Blue Heron Restaurant, and uh, Hazel's. Um, so uh, that 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 was the whole the whole enchilada for those who could who attended all of it, and uh, uh, seems to have uh, been well received. Thanks, Dr. Shabazz. It really was a quite a moving and beautiful event. And I will say um, that the the chorus, the choir, excuse me, um, was just, Hala, I just want to say <laughs> when you were singing with your hand in the air and your fist like up I it was so incredibly moving and touching and I just thank you um for for what you brought to that and what the whole choir brought so that was a piece that really moved me um so thank you for that <laughs> um and um Dr. Shabazz do you see an opportunity to offer in our next meeting a reporting of some of the feedback that was received um, in when it came back from the smaller groups. Okay, great. That would be really good, I think, for us if you think it's appropriate feedback for this body to have in terms of our work, that would be great. All right. Um, anything else on that? All right. So um, we just, um, I'm going to give a quick update on two things, and then I'm going to pass, hopefully everyone received the email I sent today with Dr. Shabazz's position paper. Um, he will be presenting that to us today. 
Dr. Rhodes and I have a hard stop today at three o'clock because we have a meeting set with the Dunahue Institute. So this is update number one. Um, we are going to meet with the Dunahue Institute um, to further the discussion that we've been having around a survey um, and developing a survey that uh, the AHRA can use to reach members of the community. Um, we have asked, I have asked our council president to join us in that conversation because it's possible that the survey that we will conduct will include surveying around public health as well as community safety. Um, and so we're going to have a discussion with the Dunhue Institute today at three o'clock, and we will report back to you at our next meeting on that. Um, the second update that I wanted to offer is, um, hold on, I do have it. <laughs> um, okay, yes. Um, I wanted to offer an update on the July 5th incident. So a couple weeks ago, I had updated the committee to say that I had made a motion that would evoke this committee or members of this committee to participate in another committee for a reconciliation process. And my vote um, did not pass through the council. It was a very close vote. Um, it lost by one vote. Um, and I recommend that everybody, if they haven't already, take a look at the video and the discussion because um, it was a very rich and thoughtful um, and I think challenging discussion that the council had around that. So um, there isn't anything in terms of that that we need to be doing right now as a committee. However, I do want to leave um, some, some space perhaps uh, for this committee to think about if there's anything um, that it would like to process around that. Um, it won't be today, but uh, we could certainly, if I hear from committee members that processing that in any way would be helpful, or if any action that this committee would like to take, um, for example, a letter to the council sponsored by the committee itself, or something of that nature, um, we could think about that. So are there any questions about either of those updates, the survey or the July 5th? Yes, Alexa. Are you looking for the questions just specifically about those updates or like discussion about those updates? Um, anything, anything. We, I, I wanted to um, at least give Dr. Shabazz a full, so if we have about five or six minutes so we can keep discussion going right now. Okay, so I, I guess I just wanted to ask in the event that the second motion doesn't pass, um, is and, and I'm confused about all these rules. I'm going to be honest with you. So it, are you able to bring forward the same motion again? Or like what happens if motion two doesn't pass? That's a great question. So um, right now what's happening is there is a motion on the floor, which is known as motion six. Um, Lynn brought that motion and that motion got tabled to tonight's meeting. In the meantime, Lynn asked that counselors provide any amendments or new motions. There were amendments that were provided. I provided a new motion. Um, all of those can be found in the packet for tonight's town council meeting. However, I am aware that Lynn will be making a motion, which I believe will pass, to postpone the discussion in its entirety to next Monday um, so that it has a designated time for it. Um, tonight is the town manager evaluation, uh, uh, as well as tax classification hearing and uh, financial indicators. So it's probably going to be an after midnight meeting <laughs> as it is. And I think that's a good call. I, I really struggle to see it keep getting postponed, but it is good to have its own designated time. So if you'd like to see the amendments to the current motion, the new motion that I'm proposing, I'm proposing that motion in addition to whatever else because my motion is specific to the incident itself. 
Um, it calls for an apology. It calls for a record of events and it calls for research, legal research into compensatory repair models, options. Um, so you could take a look at that and um, feel free to reach out with any questions to me individually and be happy to answer them. Dr. Schwaz? Yeah, I'll keep it very short just to say that, um, you know, the original uh, idea of formulating a working group that would include a representative from, um, from this body, from AHRA, along with representatives from the Human Rights uh, Commission, as well as representatives from the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee, along with counselors, I thought was a, a reasonable way way to proceed. I supported it. And I was especially supportive because I was hearing in discussion and I heard at that last meeting, Councillor uh, Greismer um, bring up this notion of, you know, based upon discussion and, and uh, our process with an AHRA that nothing could be done relative to compensation uh, based upon, you know, the findings of KP law and what was, what was, again, what's been generated in our process. And I was a little, you know, um, thought that that's where we could perhaps shed clarity in that, you know, our process is, is one thing. It's very different from this specific event the two should not be confused. And that yes, as this process is one that before any kind of direct payments or anything of that sort, as part of the reparative justice plan, we will submit, it will have to, you know, we understand it's going to go through this state legislative process, it would need to go through this, at least is what the attorneys had recommended. And, um, and that will take some time. But uh, uh, I, I wanted, I feel AHRA, as we get into some of the specifics of, of, of items that could come under the reparative justice plan, to keep in mind the justice gap, to keep in mind the harm area of, of crime and punishment, criminal, the criminal justice system, and that, they're, they're, that uh, we are hearing the, the need for th uh, that perhaps. Um, funds could go as one priority area to be able to um, compensate uh, in, in situations where uh, uh, the criminal justice system or some aspect of it has, uh, has operated in a, in a racially unfair manner or, or, or discriminatory manner. But um, I think we're going to need to discuss that one a whole lot more because, first of all, I don't think the reparative justice fund would be appropriate in instances that actually are, you know, dealing with con immediate contemporary events that um, might need to be mediated or, or dealt with in some other way. And, um, and, and that we should not be used to say that you know, you can't mediate and, and, and uh, or, or address those, hopefully outside of a lawsuit framework, uh, the town can't address those unless it's in the AHRA process. So I don't want to get too, too deep into the woods on it, but just to say that I did support the idea and I think it is something we ought to, I, I have heard brought up before of whether the reparative justice fund, one of the areas we might recommend is how it could deal with instances like this. And that's gonna be something we, we might wanna spend some time talking about down the road. Thank you for that, Dr. Shabazz. Um, and Alexis, I realized I didn't answer your question as directly as I'd like to. So um, let me just say this one more piece. Um, yes, I could certainly bring back that motion. Um, I chose not to because at this time, because one, it didn't get the support um, the first time around um, that it needed to pass. And two, because the new motion that I've put forward hopes to deal directly with what the committee would have dealt with. So the apology, so a record keeping of what occurred, the compensatory pieces. Um, and so 
while I really wanted the committee to be put in place to do that work, um, given that it didn't get the support that it needed, I chose a different strategy for this time. Thanks for asking that. Are there any other questions or comments about this? Dr. Shabazz, your hand is still up. Okay. Um, anything else? Dr. Rhodes, Hala, Pamela, Jennifer, Alexis. All right. Okay. So I'm going to pause before we turn things over to Dr. Shabazz to um, talk about his um, position paper and his framework that he'll be presenting to us today and do a public comment period. Uh, so I am calling public comment now. And if you'd like to make a comment, please go ahead and raise your hand. I will call on you and um, ask that you state your name and your address, and you'll have up to three minutes. We normally do not uh, respond, but we will be listening closely and sometimes can respond if there's a direct question. So if you'd like to make a public comment, please go ahead and raise your hand and we will bring you into the room. All right. Uh, yes, Jennifer would like to make a public comment. <laughs> no, but can you guys approve the minutes so I can get those posted and then give you guys another um, set of minutes Ash. to approve? Yeah, absolutely. Um, does everyone feel that they are prepared to approve the 615, 76, and 725 meeting minutes? All right, great. So I will move to approve the 615, 76, and 725 2022 meeting minutes. Is there a second? Okay, I, I think it was Alexis <laughs> and then Dr. Rhodes. Um, so let's start with you, Hala. Okay, we'll come back. Uh, Alexis? Yes. Dr. Rhodes? Aye. Dr. Spaz? Yes. I am also a yes. Um, so for now, I think can we just put Hala as absent from the vote or how would you like to record that, Jennifer? Um, abstain? I, I'm just, yeah. Okay, I think they pass. Um, I did say I. My bad. Oh, oh, perfect. I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. <laughs> didn't hear you. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Okay. Thank you. All right. So just to give some context, Dr. Shabazz, do you pl plan to share screen? Okay. So um, for folks who are listening, I just will briefly say that Dr. Shabazz has been working on um, a, a framework for us to consider as we move into eligibility criteria and um, use of funds and all of that uh, stuff that we'll be discussing. And so he is going to present that to us now, and that will give us an opportunity then to begin that discussion. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Shabazz. Dr. Shabazz, are you able to share screen? Or screen I, I won't share? need to. I, I thought about trying to do a PowerPoint, but uh, I'm you've you've had the um, the the paper presented to you ahead of time, and and I'm just going to highlight a few things very quickly, uh, recognizing there is a, there is a hard stop uh, for many of us. So um, with that, let me say that uh, there's great interest, and it is very important for the for AHRA to grapple with the question of who is owed and who should receive reparations in Amherst. And um, the uh, model that I am recommending to us uh, for approval is what I think of as, a, as a, uh, an inclusionary model, one that is not based upon uh, restrictiveness, but is one that also recognizes uh, uh, certain uh, critical priorities and targets for who is owed. Um, it, there are three um, elements for us as a local, um, uh, locally based uh, reparative justice planning group. And uh, 
there are th uh, then the three criterion uh, areas are residency, lineage, and identity. Uh, the uh, model, of, so on the residential standard, uh, the inclusionary model rep, rep recognizes that the, uh, in terms of who should receive reparations or the benefits of a reparative justice plan should first and foremost prioritize those who live in Amherst. Uh, and, uh, and so residency in Amherst is thus a, a critical priority area, but I don't uh, but when I speak of an inclusionary model, I like for us to recognize that those not living in Amherst uh, may have a stake as well as what happens here. So for example, uh, a 19-year-old who is away at, 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 at college or in the military or uh, in some other form of service that requires them to be outside of Amherst most of the year or, uh, uh, or at a point where temporarily their residency is no longer here in Amherst. They're not voting here. They're not paying taxes here. They are living elsewhere, but that this is not necessarily a permanent, uh, a, a permanent uh, uh, position or a permanent residency for them. And they do look to come back. In my view, then, they should not be excluded from the conversation. They should not be excluded from our uh, uh, in regards to our residential standard, but that for uh, uh, in terms of our planning uh, 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 and, and, and in terms of who we're listening to, but that again, we do recognize as a priority area, those uh, in relation to the residential standard, those who are living in Amherst now. Secondly, the lineage standard. The lineage standard has particularly uh, come up almost from the, the as this conversation has really begun to take off. Uh, and, and what this references uh, is the uh, debate over um, that when we talk about uh, Black people, people of African descent, people of African heritage, and whatnot, that um, we have to delineate or distinguish amongst those Black people, though amongst the Black population in the United States, those who have a lineage that goes back in time to uh, 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 over generations, multiple generations, and in fact, goes back in time to at, having at least one ancestor who was enslaved in the United States. This would effectively exclude uh, people who have just arrived here in the United States. They could be uh, African, they could be a Black, and, a, um, 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 and they could even have achieved citizenship and they could even be a taxpayer uh, over decades here in Amherst, but the fact that they were, uh, that they're, they don't have a presence in the United States that extends over multiple generations back to an ancestor enslaved in the United States by, the, the, by some uh, uh, models of, or, or definitions of the lineage standard, they would therefore be excluded from who is owed, who should receive benefits, and who should even be uh, considered as part of the planning purposes of a reparative justice process. I disagree with that. I think instead what we need to assert is that those who meet that lineage uh, criterion, that standard, in terms of having an ancestor who was enslaved in the United States should be a priority area within our reparative justice planning, should be, a, should be prioritized in certain respects of benefits uh, that, that might be extended through our reparative justice plan if, if acted upon, when acted upon by the town council but should not uh, um, 
Uh, but that should not mean that those who do not meet that criterion should be completely excluded. So for example, someone whose family might have come here from the Caribbean uh, in the late 1800s or come here in the early 1900s and have been here over multiple generations in Amherst, but simply for the fact that they don't have an ancestor that was enslaved in the United States, we would say in this inclusionary model, you are embraced. There may be benefits that could be extended through uh, our reparative justice plan that could encompass those who don't have an ancestor uh, that was enslaved in the United States. But again, we this model would recognize that that group uh, with that multi-generational experience in the United States with an ancestor enslaved in the United States is a priority area and is one that our planning process should recognize, uh, particularly in that part of our rationale is that we are attempting to pave the way for federal reparations in which the lineage standard may well be uh, the framework of, of federal reparations. Finally, there is the identity standard. And the identity standard is whether one defines themselves, identifies as Black, as of African heritage, as uh, an African American. Um, and again, by uh, uh, some advocates for, for reparations, especially in define, making the case for reparations at the federal level, they have insisted that, the, that there be an identity standard. Uh, and one model goes that uh, from the announcement of a reparative justice uh, uh, program. Uh, so for example, we, we, we submit our report in June of 2023. It's read, it's digested, let's say in the July or in the, in the August uh, 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 council meeting, aspects of that plan or that plan is approved and adopted and a reparative justice program begins to, to be implemented. Um, the view of one model is that persons who uh, would uh, apply for or who might receive benefits must prove that they uh, had identified as Black for at least 12 years before the start of the reparative justice program. So if we said August of 2023, we announce a program, then they would have to prove going back to at least, let us say 2020, I mean 2010, that they have some type of documented proof of having identified as Black or been identified as Black. It could be the census return from 2010. It could be a driver's license from somewhere. It could be some form of official government uh, um, uh, a document that identifies them uh, um, as, as Black or that uh, African-American and that they, they, they were so identified and they, profess that as their identity. What this really answers is a question one counselor raised some time back, what about mixed race people? Would mixed race people be eligible? And the answer then is resoundingly, yes, as long as that mixed race person, in addition to identifying as mixed race, also identified as black. And that doesn't go without saying, there could be some who have simply listed themselves and simply identify themselves as mixed race. And that doesn't tell you if they identify as black. So one would have to have documentation under, under uh, uh, within this um, identity standard that you may have identified as another race. You may have identified as mixed race, but that you have also documentation of identifying as Black, as of African descent. So for us in this inclusionary model, we recognize that identity standard. We acknowledge it as um, one that may be appropriate at the federal level and one that we should bear in mind with re in relation to our our planning, uh, but that we are not strictly, um, but that we can also uh, um, 
embrace folks that may not have uh, a proof uh, prior 12 years prior, but at least in my view, if they identify at the point of the reparations program, they still may be considered um, as eligible. But uh, uh, so that is in some the, uh, uh, the discussion that I raise on the three identity standards. And this inclusionary model is one that acknowledges uh, some of the frameworks that are being discussed that have been put forward at the federal level, and but acknowledges them as simply areas that we could recognize and build some of our planning around, but that not necessarily ex uh, uh, relying completely on that for restrictive purposes, at least in our planning planning uh, uh, area. So it gives widest latitude for encompassing people uh, as we move into defining benefits and defining uh, different ways in which the, the, uh, uh, the funds and the programs that we ultimately in, uh, endorse and put within our plan, it gives widest latitude for, for projects, ideas, uh, proposals to be incorporated uh, for people, both with those, in those priority areas, as well as maybe not within those priority areas. I open for questions. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Uh, I saw Alexis's hand and then Dr. Rhodes. Yeah, Dr. Rhodes can go first. So uh, this came in today, at least as I saw it today. There's a lot to unpack here. And there's a lot of uh, thought that needs to go into it to make it worthy of being able to respond to it, given your efforts, Dr. Shabazz. So I, I'm definitely not ready to talk about it because I'm really still unpacking it. And I printed it out and I started marking through it. And so, you know, uh, in order for me to uh, offer any kind of meaningful feedback, I would have to have a little bit more time. I think that's a really fair point for everybody. Um, I appreciate Dr. Shabazz having gotten it to me and I only got it to you all today. Um, and so was hoping Dr. Shabazz would present it to us. It would go into the packet and then we'll have a week to digest it, formulate questions um, and be able to have a really meaningful discussion about it next week. Uh, Alexis. Thank you. Um, thank you for this work, by the way, Dr. Shabazz. Um, I appreciate you putting all of that together. Um, so I have a complicated thing to throw in here because um, just because my life is complicated. And so why not speak from my experience, right? So um, being that I have, and and I guess I'm wondering, you know, is, you know, if, if, if A and B aren't necessarily um, verifiable, and I know that that puts, you know, throws a wrench in it because the genealogy aspect you could be, and, and I guess I'm wondering, and I, I know that like quantifying things have been extremely problematic in the past. Um, I'm wondering, I guess, if, if that applies to anything because, and here's my things, right? So I wasn't allowed, at least on my birth certificate, to say that I wasn't white because my grandma and my mom decided that that was a politically smart idea. Um, not that I didn't wasn't born out of a black woman, right? But like politically speaking, um, that was a decision made outside of me. Um, and that's not to say that um, in census reports and stuff like that, and like you know, in the SATs and and the MCAS and whatever else that we had to say where we had to check the boxes about what we were, um, it was always. Um, African American and white, um, but I guess like for me, that data is very. Sometimes it's this, sometimes it's this, and it was based off of the information that I was receiving from my black family members. That's the one piece, right? The second piece is that um, 
and, and that was for very particular reasons. And I'm going to be fast about this. But the second piece is that I was able to trace back my genealogy only so far um, because, of course, right, it being when you have enslaved ancestry, not everything gets recorded and not everything lasts. So I was able to trace back my ancestry um, to Robert E. Lee on my Black side. And his son was Peter Lee who was labeled you know, in the records as being mulatto. And from there they married black, 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 black until my mom messed it up. I'm just joking. But you know, it was basically like that, right? And so it, that's reaching back to like 18 something. I know Robert E. Lee was born in like 1805. And so I know for a fact that Peter Lee was not enslaved but his mother has, there's absolutely no records at all to be able to find his mother. And I highly doubt that this, that this person consensually had a baby with Robert E. Lee, right? Um, who was obviously not white. So um, I guess I'm wondering in the event that you don't have lineage proof through paperwork, um, and being that I have literally a black mother, I guess I'm wondering like, how how do you prove that, especially when my data is all jumbled up, right? May I make a quick response, Chair, uh, folks? Yes, yes, indeed. I just want, first of all, express appreciation for, for your sharing, for your honesty in respect of this, and to say this is exactly the complexity that I am wrestling with and I'm trying to contend with in this position paper that um, uh, in many of the frameworks that have been written about and been pushed at the federal level and most notably in my reparation seminar, we have been diving into Darity and Mullen's book From Here to Equality and uh, we've been tearing it up that there are so many holes, there are so many areas that this blanket kind of approach that they take don't anticipate. Uh, and so I want to highlight, first of all, with respect to the lineage complexity. This is where I believe our, in our final plan, we ought to endorse, we ought to consider endorsing a motion uh, to state government and federal government to, as one step of reparations, to fund the availability of, of DNA and genealogical research for people of African descent to avail themselves of who want to because to try and have to do this on your own. And then consider this, we talk about the wealth gap. If you're poor, where are you going to get the resources to hire a genealogist or to hire, uh, uh, you know, to pay these 200, 300, whatever dollar kits, DNA kits, and then get the interpretation from it to then be able to go and prove you deserve reparations? Who's, who's got? those thousands of dollars available. Because let me tell you, professional genealogists are not, are not cheap, okay? So who's, going to, who's able to do that, all right? So that is a, is a question I don't see in From Here to Equality. I don't see from advocates that, that push this lineage standard as, as like, you know, fixed. You know, and, and we've even gotten letters to to our, our assembly, you know, saying we're treasonous because we don't hold to to a strict lineage standard. Well, how do you how are we supposed to prove this? You're just going to show up there for your you know, expect the federal government to go to go do all of that. That's not how benefits work. The benefits work from the federal in, in the case of the Japanese. You had to show you had to come and present the evidence that you had, uh, that you were interned or that you had a parent or grandparent who was interned to get your $20,000. Now, what the, the, the support group, the advocacy group for Japanese reparations did is, is they, you know, got support together to go and do a lot of that documentation and to get from the government because the government kept records on all the people they locked up in the internment camps. So they did a lot of that legwork to, to get the evidence to create the role of who got the $20,000 checks, okay? But how do you do this for potentially 36 million African-Americans uh, or more, actually more that, that could be eligible uh, under the, under the, the, the federal uh, plan. 
So somebody's got to take responsibility to, uh, I think the federal government ought to take responsibility to help provide the genealogical research and the DNA research, uh, the finding your roots, if you will, for African-Americans of which this is one of the direct harms that broke us from having any kind of, of uh, 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 ability to trace our, our lineage like that. So that's one area with respect to the lineage. On the identity one, this is another important complexity that again, by my recognizing the, uh, the issue of, uh, that some have raised of the need to show documentation at more than a decade before the start of the reparations program, that just saying that can be easy for the policymaker or for the, you know, the economist to, to, to come up with that, but the implications on the ground for masses of people can also be, be, be uh, challenging in ways you have to really think about. You know, faced with a white supremacist, structurally racist system, a white parent and a black parent, it is, in my mind, completely reasonable that they might opt to say in a choice of what bubble to, to fill out, they might say W and not say black and not or not say other or not say multiple. Okay, and it is their choice to do so. But then what does that mean down the line with respect to a reparative justice process in which that infant had no choice? At the point that those 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 boxes were that that W box was checked, what does that say for them? Are they thus you know their 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 entitlement to to what is owed negated because of the decisions being made between one or both parents to to mark the W box, even when they could perhaps prove the lineage standard. You know, and show that they had an ancestor who was enslaved through their black side. They could still then be di be disqualified on the basis of the identity standard. So I think again, what you've just presented highlights some of the some of the complexities that I think as we grapple with this on the local level. It, my recommendation is to have this inclusionary model that acknowledges. The, the priority areas or the targets or the, the, the standards that have been raised at the, for the federal uh, uh, rep reparative justice process, but doesn't, but doesn't limit our attention strictly to those, uh, uh, to, to, to those more res restrictive standards that have been advocated. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. And we will um, certainly have much more conversation around this. That was really rich and very appreciative to you, Alexis, for sharing that personal piece to give us um, this ability to discuss these nuances and the complexities. Um, Dr. Rhodes, if you want to jump off while I call one more public comment to get on with Kerry, feel free to do that. <laughs> That didn't take long. <laughs> I'm just going to call one more public comment to see if there is anybody in the audience who would like to make a public comment. Um, you are able to just go ahead and raise your hand, please, and we will bring you into the room. You have up to three minutes to make a public comment, and we will be listening very carefully to you. Okay, not seeing any, just want to thank the attendees who joined us today. Really, really appreciate you being here and um, please um, continue to join us. Um, <laughs> I can't really see what you're showing, but um, okay. So are there any other comments or questions by counselors or Pamela and Jennifer? All right. And Alexis, I'll touch base with you about scheduling and um, may everyone have a beautiful week and we'll see each other next week again. And I'm going to adjourn at 3.02 PM. Thank you. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Bye.
Jennifer, if you could keep it open for a second, just for uh, me to reach out to Pamela and Michelle, you can you can go. This is okay. I, I just been wanting to say to you, Pamela, been very interested 